Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, we're live again from the course of Molecular Ecology Applied to uh, Molecular Methods Applied to Animal Ecology uh, course with one more uh, presenter. The speaker today is Dr. Cara Brook from University of Chicago. Uh, Cara Brook is an assistant professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Chicago. She received her PhD in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from Princeton University in 2017, uh, then served as a Miller Postdoctoral Fellow and a Bronco Ways uh, Society Science Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, her research focused on understanding the role of bats as reservoirs uh, of emerging zoonotic diseases at both uh, a within host and population level. She runs also a long-term field study on flying fox in Madagascar, which is super exciting. Uh, and she's going to talk today about metagenomic next generation sequencing to elucidate bat virus, bat virus dynamics in Madagascar. So it's a big pleasure to have here uh, Dr. Cara Brook with you, everyone. Thanks so much, Ernani, for the uh, introduction and the invitation to speak. I'm excited to be here. Um, as Ermanani said, uh, I'm uh, just starting out as an assistant professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Chicago, though still affiliated uh, with my postdoc university, uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and then I also maintain uh, an appointment as a, a research associate with the virology unit at the Institute Pasteur of Madagascar. And I'm going to be talking today about some of the uh, metagenomic sequencing that we're doing um, mostly on the zoonosis side, but also pulled in a little bit to the human health side um, with, um, with the COVID epidemic in Madagascar. Um, so it should come as no surprise uh, to all of you that um, SARS-CoV-2, the causative agent in COVID-19, finds its origins um, in related coronaviruses found in the subgenus uh, Sarbeca virus, um, which are linked to, um, which circulate in wild populations of rhinophilid uh, horseshoe bats. So this is uh, Rhinophilus affinis, um, a bat found in southern and western China, um, where the most closely related sequence to SARS-CoV-2 has, has been uh, described. And this is a phylogeny of all beta corona, uh, all alpha and beta coronaviruses, um, which generally um, are affiliated with bat origins. Um, there are um, five subgenera of beta coronavirus in particular, and of those five, um, four of them, including the Sarbeca virus subgenus that includes SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, um, all find their origins in wild bat species. So this is from uh, a review paper that one of the students that I work with in Madagascar put together uh, j just last fall. Um, bats are also the natural reservoir host for uh, the majority of the world's most virulent zoonotic viruses. So um, those high profile viruses include rabies and related lysaviruses, Hendra and Nipah Henipah viruses, Ebola and Marburg filoviruses, in addition to the coronaviruses, SARS, MERS, uh, and SARS-CoV-2. And what's really interesting is that bats appear to host these viruses without themselves experiencing a substantial disease. They don't get sick from these infections leading researchers to ask, are they somehow special in their capacity for viral hosting? Um, bats are special in many ways, and it appears that uh, a number of these um, anti-disease uh, anti features, their ability to host viruses without getting sick, uh, traces back to their role as the only flying or uh, mammal. So, um, we think that bats evolved unique anti-inflammatory cellular pathways to enable flight. So a bat in flight will expend more than two times the metabolic energy of a terrestrial animal at full speed running. And typically we see this trade-off between uh, high metabolic rates and lifespan. So organisms that tend to have very short um, uh, very high metabolic rates and sh uh, have short lifespans. But bats, on the other hand, um, are actually the longest lived for their body size of any known mammal. So I show here on the X axis, the log of the adult body mass, and then on the Y axis, the log of average lifespan with all mammals in black and bats in red. So bats are on average around two and a half times longer lived than a non-flying eutherian mammal of about the same size. And so the hypothesis is that because flight is so 
physiologically damaging, um, leads to the accrual of oxidative stress intracellularly, that for it to even have been evolutionarily possible, bats had to first evolve these unique anti-inflammatory cellular pathways, um, which I'm not gonna talk about in detail today, but they, um, they involve loss of certain gene families associated with inflammasome formation, and then dampened expression of a number of other pathways. Um, that because they evolved these, uh, these abilities to uh, enable flight, they then had cascading consequences on bat longevity, as well as on their tolerance of viruses that cause damage within the cell that can be construed as similar to that experienced in, in aging. Um, in addition, viruses also cause uh, significant inflammation because they recruit immune cells to the site of infection, and bats' anti-inflammatory pathways seem um, very effective at mitigating this immunopathological damage. And so in turn, um, I do some theoretical work suggesting that these uh, tolerant mechanisms, um, this mitigation of damage uh, uh, caused by viruses actually may also support the evolution of viruses that are virulent that cause damage upon emergence into non-bat species. And so we can think about this uh, conceptually. Um, a virus typically will evolve to maximize its capacity for between host infections. I'm sure you've heard all this year heard uh, the term R0 thrown around, the reproductive, uh, basic reproduction number of, of a pathogen, the number of new infections it causes uh, when a single infection is introduced into a completely naive host population. So a virus needs to spread to new hosts in order to be able to persist. And typically a virus spreads to new hosts more effectively if it reaches a higher viral density within some transmission medium. So in this instance, a cough. But at the same time, in order to reach a high density in the cough, the virus has to replicate to high levels within the original host. And that can, be, uh, that can cause disease, cause pathology to that host or what we call virulence. And so we talk about the transmission virulence trade-off that a virus evolves to maximize its growth rates so that it can maximize transmission mission while mitigating virulence. In the case of bats, however, they appear to accrue less virulence, they experience less disease for the same density that can give an equivalent level of transmission. And so this lifts that evolutionary ceiling on the virulence transmission trade-off, suggesting that bats should be able to evolve viruses that have high growth rates that then might cause virulence upon spillover into a non-bat host. Um, and so I do some theoretical work. Um, I'm not gonna talk about extensively today. Um, these are pairwise invasibility plots, um, basically building a theoretical model of uh, an immune system um, that's similar to uh, a, a traditional mammal and then more similar to a bat. Um, and, and we can um, evolve the resident virus growth rate that's actually able to invade the system. And basically what, we, what we're finding is that um, we're selecting for higher growth rate viruses in, in these bat-inspired immune systems. Um, and you can read a bit more about that work uh, at the within host level. Um, we did some cell culture experiments fitting one of these models um, to um, uh, some experiments we put together where we infected bat cells uh, and non-bat mammalian cells with viruses and then uh, tried to estimate the virus spread rate across a tissue culture cell. So this is a, a SIR type disease model fit to um, the spread of virus across a monolayer of bat cells cells in this case. Uh, and what we find are that we, um, we estimate these higher growth rates uh, under um, bat, bat cell immune conditions. And this also fits with what we see in the literature. Um, with a grad student in my postdoc lab, uh, we put together a meta-analysis a couple of years ago um, where we collected the case fatality rates of um, viruses that spill over from, um, from uh, animals, uh, ma mammals in particular, uh, as well as birds into, uh, into human hosts. And what we find is that the vast majority of these high, uh, highly fatal viruses are hosted by bats shown here in purple. Um, bats also host a number of viruses that are not highly virulent, but these high virulence viruses seem to be really linked to order Chiroptera. 
So sort of switching gears a little bit, um, we're interested in where these highly virulent viruses come from and what circumstances lead to their emergence in the human population. Uh, and my research group has been conducting zoonotic surveillance, uh, studying endemic Madagascar fruit bats since 2013, the beginning of my PhD. So we call ourselves Equipa Fanihi, which is team fruit bat in Madagascar. Um, and there are three uh, endemic fruit bat species on the island of Madagascar that we study, Yedalon duprinum, Tropus rufus, and Rosettus madagascariensis. Um, so I work in Madagascar uh, for several reasons. It's a closed island ecosystem. These fruit bats are endemic, meaning they're found nowhere else in the world, uh, and they um, do not have much contact with the mainland. They don't leave the island. There are a few insectivorous bat species that uh, populate some of the Comoros Islands in between. Um, so there are mechanisms of contact with, with the African continent, but uh, it's about as closed of a system as you could possibly get. Uh, in addition, um, the evolutionary origins of these three endemic fruit bat species are, are quite fascinating for disease purposes. So uh, Iadolon duprinum and Rosettus madagascariensis um, are both sister species of Iadolon helvum and uh, Rosettus aegypticus on the African continent, which are uh, the known reservoir hosts for Ebola and Marburg filoviruses, so one of the big uh, zoonotic viral families. Teropus rufus, on the other hand, uh, is in the Teropus genus, and uh, Teropus genus bats are primarily Asian in their distribution, so this is their range limit. So Madagascar and then Zanzibar and Pemba are the furthest west uh, in their range, and these bats have been linked to circulation and emergence of Hendra and Nipah Henipa viruses, which um, are also hemorrhagic fevers that spill over um, from bats, um, often to an intermediary host, uh, horses in the case of Hendra and pigs in the case of Nipah, um, and direct human to bat transmission of Nipah takes place annually in Bangladesh. Um, so both uh, continuously ongoing uh, public health threats. Madagascar fruit bats are also highly threatened. Um, they're all um, red listed uh, species on the IUCN red list. Uh, Tropus rufus in particular appears to be uh, experiencing very severe population declines because it's heavily hunted as a source of human food. So this is a picture from my colleague Chris Golden showing fruit bats being consumed in northeastern Madagascar and the Kiramaswala Peninsula. And finihi again is the word for flying fox listed here on a Malagasy menu. So in order to understand this process of zoonosis, um, we typically use these models, um, uh, compartmental differential equation models that you've probably been seeing a lot in the news this year. So the susceptible infectious recovered model is its, is its um, most famous form. And when we apply these models to data, we attempt to use molecular methods to help us identify a bat's infection state, to help identify when we catch an animal in the wild, is it susceptible, is it infectious? or is it recovered and can, uh, can we class it into one of these three categories and then be able to understand the dynamics of the pathogen in the system. And so I just wanna point out that a susceptible individual is one who's naive to infection, never seen this pathogen before. An infectious individual is one who is currently infected and transmitting to others. So this red dotted line signifies the, uh, the contributions of the infectious class to the transmission rate. So if you have uh, more infectious individuals in a population, you'll have a higher population level transmission rate. And then recovered individuals in this case are those which are antibody positive, or we say seropositive meaning that we can take a sample of serum um, and use a variety of molecular methods to actually test it and, um, and, and know that bat's antibody status. So typically in disease modeling, uh, we're working with human infectious case counts over time. This is what you see a lot with COVID today. So we are trying to fit these SIR dynamics to one of these three state variables. We know the population that is infectious. Sometimes we also know the population that's susceptible. In this case, at the beginning of the COVID-19 epidemic, that was all humans um, who had not previously seen. And then we can use serology to understand the recovered class. But you can just use one of these state variables in order to fit these models and understand transmission dynamics, um, though the inference is, is better um, when we have information on multiple categories. Um, and so when we fit to this I class, um, in the simplest sense, we can estimate R0, the basic reproduction number, as the pathogen's capacity for ongoing transmission divided by the loss of transmission that occurs due 
to uh, natural mortality of that host and virulence incurred by the virus on the host. So this is again where we see that transmission virulence trade-off. The virus is trying to maximize r naught by gains in transmission while reducing virulence to the host. Uh, and r naught can take on much more complicated forms when these SIR models change. Um, in the case of wildlife, uh, it's often very difficult to get these infectious case count data, which is one of the reasons that metagenomic sequencing that I'll uh, go into a bit more um, in a few minutes has been really important in our system. Um, because we don't have bats reporting to hospitals when they're sick, we, we lack these uh, time series of infectious case counts and we're often going out into the field capturing an individual and then trying to take some kind of unbiased approach to understand what its infection status is. And serology is often a much better proxy um, because antibodies are maintained for a long time. So an individual is much more likely to be seropositive if it's experienced infection in its past than for us to get lucky and actually capture an individual that's, that's infectious and shedding virus at the time of infection. But often you have these really high population level seroprevalences, so the number or the proportion seropositive within that population, because it kind of levels off once, once they maintain immunity, they maintain it, if they maintain it for life, you're just gonna have you know, 50, 60% of the population that's seropositive. And it's kind of hard to understand what the dynamics are over time. So we can add, uh, add aging to, um, to as another uh, another piece of information, and we can um, uh, compute what we call an age seroprevalence curve. So here we have the proportion seropositive um, for a given age. And so I do a lot of model fitting to these age seroprevalence data. Um, in the case of bats, uh, we actually age them from their teeth. We can extract teeth under anesthesia um, and uh, actually use histological methods. Um, bats put down annual layers of a tissue called cementin, or fruit bats do, um, which much like a tree ring, you can actually count the layers. Um, but there's a PhD student that's working with me who's actually, actually developing tools to age with epigenetics um, so that we can um, sequence the methylome of these individuals uh, and get an understanding of age that way, which is um, holds a lot of promise for the future since the tooth extraction um, is both um, invasive and, and and also time consuming in the field. But we uh, so we're trying to catch uh, to put together these age seroprevalence data. Um, and it's important to note too that we aren't limited to just this SIR type model. We can take a bunch of different model structures in order to try and understand infection dynamics. And so um, this is just to give you an idea of how we might see seasonal pulses in virus shedding uh, under a number of different hypotheses of the mechanism that is driving those, those transmission dynamics. And so I include an M class here for maternally immune. So bats, just like humans, inherit antibodies through lactation from their mothers. Um, so we have a short period of time where young, young juveniles will be maternally immune and they will be seropositive, antibody positive. Um, they will become susceptible and then they'll get exposed, become infectious and then recover. But they might then wane in their antibody status to return to the susceptible class. Um, or we can experiment with a number of different uh, dynamics. Um, but all that is to say that these models are only as good as the field data against which we can evaluate them. So I've been working in Madagascar in collaboration with uh, Institute Pasteur, in particular Jean-Michel Ayrault, who's the um, former uh, uh, virology unit director there, Christian Ronay Vusen, um, who's a postdoc uh, and a good friend of mine. Um, and then uh, Dr. Lin Fa Wong at Duke National University of Singapore is also on this grant supporting uh, some of our serology. Um, and so this is Equipa Fanihi. We go out into the field uh, on a monthly basis. We capture fruit bats, these three different species from um, uh, a number of field sites that we track longitudinally. Um, we try to focus on fine scale temporal sampling. So we're trying to build these time series. So we capture uh, at the same sites every month. Um, and we're interested in concurrent serological and viral shedding data. So trying to fill both that R class with the serology, the recovered class, 
class, and then the I class with that viral shedding information. And this is what we've uh, really been focusing on in the more recent years, uh, is trying to get inference into, into the infectious state. Um, and then uh, we also are fortunate enough that we're able to recapture individuals in the system. They have high fidelity to, um, to their home roost site. Uh, so all of these bats are pit tagged um, and we can actually track the dynamics of a single individual over time. Um, so this is um, a model fit to uh, age seroprevalence data for a Nipah-like Hennepah virus that infects our Eidolon duprianum fruit bats. Um, and this is just to give you a sense of how the model matches with the data. So the data here are the open circles and dashed line in the background. And we can see that there is this high seroprevalence in the neonates um, that declines across that first year of life. Bats then become exposed and mount an antibody response that increases and then wanes again in these later age classes. So this is a this is an interesting age seroprevalence curve for something like measles with in human populations where we have perfect immunity after infection and exposure that we maintain for life. Age seroprevalence will always increase with age, but this waning in late ages. Uh, can mean a number of different things. It means that these older individuals might uh, be dying as a hazard of that previous exposure, that previous infection. They potentially could be losing immunity and returning to the susceptible class. But when that happens, we typically see that this actually plateaus because there is a hazard of infection in these late ages. And then what we actually ended up doing in fitting this model to these data is assuming an N class where bats do lose their seropositive status. They leave that recovered class, that R class, they become antibody negative, but they maintain uh, immunity via cell mediated mechanisms. And so you've probably heard in discussion of COVID-19 vaccines, for instance, that we can measure the antibody response and that people do have a waning antibody response with time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're no longer protected from reinfection. And that's because there are a number of other mechanisms, innate and cell mediated, by which we can defend against subsequent infections, but we lack the molecular tools to assay those. So in terms of future work, uh, building those tools to be able to identify what a non-antibody mediated immune bat looks like an N class is really, really important. Uh, so in this case, um, our model, you know, does a decent job of fitting to the data, but there's a lot of questions about what's going on at this tail end. And in particular, these circle sizes correspond to uh, the number of individuals uh, at each of these time points. So you can see that we have just very little information about these older age bats. So hard to know uh, what the truth is. And that's why we've been focusing on this really intensive sampling over the last couple of years. So I should say that this is model uh, fit to older data, and we're reworking this with our, um, our new data collection in recent years. Uh, however, we could have a lot better inference into the mechanisms driving these viral dynamics if we knew more than just the antibody positive class, if we also could understand either the N class or in this case, the I class. But infectious states have proven elusive to identify by PCR. So uh, filoviruses, for instance, tend to be shed in bat saliva uh, and henipoviruses shed in bat urine. And so we can take those samples and actually use uh, targeted molecular approaches to identify what pathogen is circulating. But that can be difficult to do when you work in a place like Madagascar, where a number of these viruses are novel, they're infecting bats that have not been extensively studied before, and we might miss something with a targeted primer approach. So metagenomic next generation sequencing uh, offers a powerful tool for zoonotic surveillance because it takes this unbiased approach where we can take RNA extracted from one of these uh, bat excreta samples, be it urine or be it saliva, and we can sequence that, uh, that RNA with an unbiased library prep, a metagenomic prep, and then we can blast the resulting sequences um, working with uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub and uh, a platform that they've built, IDSeq, that essentially does a de novo assembly uh, and looks for the closest hits to any, any contig that it's able to assemble of um, contiguous uh, genomic sequence in, uh, in GenBank. And then from there, we can build up to actually identify positives. And so uh, 
I should say, we're trying to actually develop this metagenomic sequencing technology in Madagascar. So previous to 2020, uh, the island of Madagascar had no sequencing that took place in country for either research purposes or for public health purposes. Anytime that a sample needed to be sequenced, be that uh, a wildlife sample that was being studied by an ecologist or a human infectious disease sample that was going to be studied by a physician. It had to be exported uh, typically to, to Europe, to France, or to uh, South Africa as the two closest. So in 2019, um, we, um, I, in collaboration with Institute Pasteur of Madagascar, uh, received an award from Bill and Melinda Gates to uh, develop next generation sequencing technology in Madagascar to identify the etiology of undiagnosed human fevers. And so uh, Institute Pasteur is the national reference laboratory uh, for all febrile illness in the island of Madagascar. So they receive samples with ILI symptoms, influenza-like symptoms, so that's fever uh, and cough um, from all 114 districts across the island. They undergo routine testing, targeted testing via PCR for uh, typical um, respiratory infections, so respiratory syncteliovirus, influenza, and then rhinovirus, the common cold. But about a quarter of those are never diagnosed. And so our original approach to the Gates Foundation was to use MNGS to decipher the etiology of these undiagnosed fevers. And so we also have been using it um, as sort of um, an extension and uh, and uh, uh, a boon associated with having that technology in country to uh, identify some of these novel viruses in, in our bats. And so just in this past uh, year, we've actually been able to identify the sequence, um, not yet full genome, but close. We've got about 14,000 base pairs out of 18,000 uh, of this Hennepa virus that I showed you the serological information uh, about previously in, that infects Eidolon duprianum bats. And so you'll see here, this is uh, a maximum likelihood phylogeny of, um, of paramyxaviruses and the Hennepa virus family is shown here in this reddish brown color. So there's only five previously described Hennepa virus species. Uh, Hendra uh, found, uh, Nipah found in, um, in South Asia, Hendra found in Australia, Cedar virus, uh, which has also been described out of um, Australia and parts of, of, of South Asia, that is a bat infecting only virus, Kumasi that circulates in the idol and Helvum, uh, uh, African straw-colored fruit bat on the on the African continent, and then uh, a rodent-borne Moisian virus that has been uh, identified in um, in human cases in China. So this Madagascar Hennepa virus, which appears to be quite divergent from the clade, but still uh, still maps within um, the Hennepa virus uh, family, um, Hennepa virus genus. Um, uh, would be the the sixth. So we're in the process of trying to just des uh, describe that now. And this is work in collaboration with Dr. Amy Kistler, who is um, the uh, group leader for the infectious disease component of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. Um, and I should say that the Biohub provided training uh, in next generation sequencing for uh, two Malagasy scientists, Christian Rane Vusin, um, and uh, Siri Rondra Manasana, who came to uh, San Francisco and, and actually uh, learned these techniques before our machine was brought into the country. Um, in addition, um, we've been able to identify several uh, new sequences of bat-borne coronaviruses that are circulating in these Madagascar fruit bats. So we're in the process of trying to describe those as well. Um, so these cluster in the Nebeka virus, um, subgenus of the beta coronavirus genus. Um, so shown down here. And then again, remember SARS-CoV-2 falls in this Sarbecaviruses subgenus. So no Becaviruses are adjacent to Sarbecaviruses, but have been previously only described uh, in, in bats and in particular teropodid fruit bats um, uh, in the teropodidae family. Um, so we have a few new ones to add to that. Uh, and we've been using this MNGS approach uh, on these human um, undiagnosed respiratory infections in Madagascar. And so what's come out of that is that we've been able to identify um, a number of uh, human common cold causing coronaviruses that appear to be responsible for infection in some of these individuals. Um, so highlighting here in yellow, um, HCoV OC43 is one of the um, most common human 
common cold causing coronaviruses um, that we've sequenced in Madagascar and uh, HKU1, um, which is a, a rodent borne uh, coron uh, zoonotic coronavirus that we've also been able to identify. So it appears that um, of that quarter of undiagnosed human fevers uh, at, with Institute Pasteur, that uh, metagenomic next generation sequencing um, has been able to help us identify um, about a quarter of those, uh, of those one quarter that are undiagnosed appear to be um, appear to be of coronavirus origin, and it's really important to understand circulating coronaviruses on the island of Madagascar, both in the wildlife and in the human side, because coronaviruses as a clade are um, are highly prone to um, to recombination. So they're among the most likely viruses to host switch. And part of that reason is that they are able to swap genetic material with those viruses that are closely closely adjacent. So this is zooming in on that Sarbeca virus lineage um, in the coronavirus phylogeny. Um, so down here, we actually see lineage four, which is the subclade of coronaviruses that appear to have this capacity to bind ACE2 um, and enter human cells. And those more closely related lineages um, tend to group geographically. But when they, uh, when individuals, when bat hosts, for instance, um, that host these different viruses are brought into close proximity, we get this uh, opportunity for viruses to infect the same cell, uh, exchange genetic material, and for recombination and the formation of a new virus to take place. So. Um, just a few features of the coronavirus genome that make it particularly prone to recombination. Um, they, uh, in order to emerge in a novel host, a virus has to first be able to enter the host cells and then hijack that host cell machinery to, uh, to allow for replication. And so there's this big bottleneck at even being able to infect host cells. So coronaviruses target very well conserved host cell mach machinery. So cell receptors uh, like ACE ACE2 um, and um, uh, DPPR, which uh, is the Merbeca virus um, um, uh, receptor, are widely distributed across many different mammalian clades. So already they have a leg up in, in, that, uh, in that sense. And then um, they also appear to be extremely flexible in their ability to use those cell receptors. So SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, for instance, both use the ACE2 receptor, but use different parts of that receptor and their receptor binding domains of the virus are, are quite divergent from one another. Um, so in addition to um, capturing, a, 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 to being able to enter a cell, then once they, once they achieve that, they then need to be able to um, actually replicate. And so um, coronaviruses you may have heard are really unique in that they have this RNA proofreading capacity in their polymerase. Um, so most uh, RNA viruses are quite small. So dengue virus, for instance, is around 11,000 base pairs and coronaviruses are around 29,000, so close to 30, so almost three times the size. And we think that the reason for that is that they have this capacity for proofreading. So they're able to catch errors in their genome that might otherwise um, mean that the virus uh, reaches an error threshold where it, it cannot go on um, functioning because it's uh, accumulating too many errors in that replication phase. And so because of this uh, proofreading capacity, they also have extremely large genomes. And when you have more genetic material circulating in a cell, the capacity for recombination um, becomes much more likely. Um, they also have this template switching mechanism of replication whereby um, the RNA polymerase actually detaches from uh, the strand that it's reading and reattaches and it can sort of reattach to a neighboring, uh, a, a neighboring um, uh, chain of genetic material um, to build this recombinant genome. So uh, a few features as to why these uh, viruses are, are particularly prone to recombination. So um, all that is to say that we're using um, metagenomic sequencing um, for zoonotic surveillance in Madagascar, 
But our machine, after the training um, with this Gates Foundation grant, actually arrived to Madagascar around um, March 5th of 2020. And Madagascar's borders have been closed uh, almost completely since um, since March 20th of 2020. So um, the machine got in and uh, lockdown happened almost immediately. And we've had to shift a lot of this work to actually sequencing SARS-CoV-2, which is not necessarily a metagenomic sequencing approach, but um, is, is a targeted sequencing approach um, to help do sur genomic surveillance in Madagascar. So some of the questions we're interested in, estimating the timing and source of the Madagascar epidemic, estimating underreporting of cases um, by comparing uh, effective population size in the genetic material, deciphering patterns of cross connectivity um, across the island, and then also more recently um, doing surveillance for variants of concern. So this plot off to the right is from um, Next Strain, um, the uh, online platform, and you can see um, we've been able to introduce Madagascar sequences. So I'm gonna take a couple minutes and just talk about um, some of that SARS-CoV-2 work um, just really briefly. So um, <laughs> for the longest time um, after this platform arrived to Madagascar, there were no reagents available. Um, there were limited flights going into the country, uh, but eventually we were able to um, several months later get supplies in and get the team on site um, up and 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 actually sequencing, uh, and then there was a number of trouble uh, troubleshooting steps that went through before we actually got the platform up and running. So it's pretty recent that um, uh, we've actually been um, been functional in country. Um, so after those first initial runs, we were able to generate just six sequences um, that were nonetheless extremely informative, uh, highlighting some of these introductions of SARS-CoV-2 to Madagascar. Um, so in particular, uh, a couple of sequences isolated from some Filipino mine workers in uh, the eastern city of Tomatov um, were linked to the 19A clade, which is, has since almost globally disappeared um, because these um, um, uh, these workers came from um, South Asia where this virus was circulating at the time. And then all of the other introductions have been linked to travel uh, back and forth from Europe. Um, Subsequently, um, we've seen almost entire elimination of this 19A clade. Um, it lacks this D614G mutation that's now almost universally fixed across the globe. Um, and uh, it appears that um, uh, it, 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 it has been shown to make the virus more effective in its transmission capacity. Um, and so we've seen that proliferate across the island. Most of the sequences still are this clade 20B, um, which is again of this um, of this uh, origin um, uh, European origin. Um, and we're also seeing, um, so here are sequences all across Madagascar, um, distributed um, across the island, and we're seeing proliferation of, um, of um, uh, particular clades within particular regions, which is as expected. So we see some clustering by site. All of these sequences are identified by color uh, based on their point on the map. And um, we've also recently sequenced um, uh, 501v2, which is the South, so-called South African variant that's now spreading um, quite extensively in northeastern Madagascar. And that's probably related to either shipping travel or tourism travel. Um, a few individ a few flights were permitted into um, an island resort in this part of Madagascar. Um, so that is to say that next generation sequencing that we originally developed um, as this uh, platform to understand animal uh, animal ecology has been has allowed us to trace zoonoses from bat to human and uh, around the planet. But I just wanted to end by saying that um, SARS-CoV-2 comes from bats. That's true, but we can't blame the bats for COVID-19. Um, so Peggy Eby, who's um, a research associate at the University of New South Wales in Australia and a, a collaborator on this Bat One Health project um, that I'm involved in, linking bat virus dynamics um, in Madagascar and Bangladesh and in Australia, has actually been able to show in the Australian system that bats shed less virus when they're in better nutritional conditions. So she has an effort uh, underway that she calls Trees for Public Health uh, that's designed to um, 
increase the uh, the fruit availability to um, uh, increase the nectar availability to these bats in um, in uh, parts of Australia um, because we find that when they uh, consume a diet mostly of domesticated fruit products they're actually um, actually getting less protein um, so they need um, need uh, pollen in particular is a high protein source for them and when they're feeding on wild nectar they also intake intake pollen uh, and that nutritional input um, then converts to their immunity and we see that they are um, are, are a, better able to control their infections. So um, we get this nice sort of confluence of, um, of benefits to biodiversity and converse, uh, conservation that also link to uh, human public health. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and end there um, and say Misotra Basica to a number of different um, funding sources, um, obviously doing a lot of human health work um, with the Gates Foundation, the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub and the Innovative Genomics Institute at UC Berkeley. Um, and then also um, much more on the conservation side with National Geographic, Bat Conservation International um, and uh, Luby Bat Conservancy. So um, number of collaborators across the globe, and then uh, I think we'll have plenty of time for questions. So I'll go ahead and um, plan to move over into the uh, adjacent room to take those questions.